Hi, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Today we're going to continue the restoration and repair of this ARP Quadra synthesizer. In the last video we recapped the power supply and the rest of the boards in the lower half of the synthesizer. So now we're going to move up to the large circuit boards at the top of the synthesizer with the sliders. I've already pulled off the slider caps and the sliders are very, very stiff and sticky feeling. Uh, this quadra had been stored in a road case and the foam had started to degrade and I can see that the foam got into the sliders. Normally I replace the sliders on ARFs with new LED sliders but the buyer of this particular quadra wants to keep things original. So we're going to desolder and disassemble each one of these sliders to give them a proper restoration. The first of the two boards is the one on the left which is called the polysynth board. And while they name it after the polysynth section, this also houses the bass section and the controls for the string section. So along the bottom we have a row of LEDs which are the uh, switch, membrane switch indicators. And then all the sliders which are the controls for the bass, uh, string, and polysynth section. So over here on the left side of the board we have the VCO for the bass section which we can spot easily due to the uh, ARP temperature compensating resistor and the thermally coupled transistor pair here. ARP used an odd value 1.87 kilo ohm temperature compensating resistor in all their designs, just to be different I guess. But like I mentioned in the previous video, the ARP Quadra base section uses a true voltage controlled oscillator unlike the Omni 2, so it can respond to CV inputs. And the VCO in this area over here uh, is entirely made out of discretes, so we have transistors, JFETs, and the IC from the oscillator is uh, actually just a transistor array. It's a 3086 chip. Um, there's also an envelope generator, a VCF, and some gating logic for the base section over in this area. In the last video, we recapped three boards that were pretty much lifted from the ARP Omni 2 design, the upper and lower voicing board and the phaser. Since the Quadra basically contains an Omni 2, and this board houses the strings in the polysynth section, this board essentially contains all the remaining electronics that would make up an Omni 2. So the things that are normally done by those three boards with the sliders from the Omni are done all here on this board. In fact, you can see there's slider controls that correspond to the ARP Omni slider controls and a 4075 voltage controlled filter submodule that you'd see on an ARP Omni synthesizer board is all on here as well. The circuit's not exactly the same, but it's not radically different from the Omni. So I'm going to start off by removing all of these sliders and all the tantalum capacitors and any electrolytic capacitors as well. And uh, when I do that, or as I do that, I'm going to give the board a nice close visual inspection for any signs of, of problems. And here's a close-up of the sliders. You can see the road case foam inside. If you just were to spray these things with contact cleaner like a putz, you would just be pushing that stuff down into the slider and making things worse. So there's no taking shortcuts with, uh, with these. In order to clean the sliders, you have to remove them from the circuit board, disassemble them, and give them a proper cleaning and restoration. So we're also going to remove this 4075 filter submodule. The uh, 4075 filter submodule is one where ARP had made a calculation error and uh, it limited the cutoff frequency of the filter to about 12 kilohertz. So we're going to take this out, we're going to recap it, we're going to make the correction uh, to enhance that filter. So here's the polysynth board with the sliders and the tantalum and electrolytic capacitors removed. And I'm going to take this restoration up a notch and I'm going to change out all the ICs on this board. Um, the uh, CMOS and the TTL chips and the linear chips like the op amps and comparators have a fairly high failure rate. Um, when I take a broken synth and I go through and I restore it, uh, usually I don't change all the chips, um, but then during the troubleshooting process I'll find, you know, several of them are, are bad. So what I'm going to do here is uh, this board, since this board uh, you don't actually have access to the top side of it when it's mounted in the synth. Uh, it'll make troubleshooting it fairly difficult. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change out all those chips proactively. Um, so it'll save me a little time down the road potentially. It's a little more upfront investment in time and cost. Uh, but hopefully in the end it'll save me some time troubleshooting. And uh, it'll make, you know, by replacing these with brand new chips in, in IC sockets, It'll make the synth more reliable long-term for its new owner. You can see there's a bunch of these RCA 
CMOS chips like this 4011, this 4001, the 4013, and these uh, RCA chips have a pretty darn high failure rate. So um, it's going to be interesting to see if I can get them out without destroying them. It would be interesting to test them and see if any of them in fact were bad. But uh, there's quite a number of chips here. And this approach of changing out the chips, uh, it, it's actually a pretty valid approach, particularly if you don't have like an oscilloscope or you know a background in electronics. Uh, you can go in with a kit that I have on my website, synthchaser.com, just replace all these chips with known brand new good ones, and you kind of uh, eliminate the hurdle of, of the troubleshooting and, and repairing of tracking down each individual faulty chip. So I've gone a step further and I've taken out the 3086 chips. Those are transistor arrays, and uh, I... Initially, I was thinking I would take them out of circuit just to, uh, to test the transistors and make sure that they were good. Uh, but then I decided I'm actually going to replace them with 3046s, which are also uh, transistor arrays with the same pinout. But they have better matching between transistors than the 3086s. And since these are used in the uh, VCO and VCA uh, matching of transistors, it is important. So uh, it will be an improvement to put in the... 3046s, uh, even though they're obsolete, and uh, I could put those chips back and, and they would be fine, um, since I'm kind of going all out here, uh, I am not going to spare any expense. And this is the board with all the sliders, capacitors, and IC chips removed. Uh, it looks pretty bare there. There's just some resistors and capacitors and trimmers and transistors and stuff. Uh, and this is the stuff that I've taken out. So I've taken out all the sliders. I've taken out 43 IC chips and a little pile of capacitors. And then I've got dirty Q-tips here. Um, no, that's not from my ears. That's from cleaning the uh, flux residue off the bottom of the board uh, from where the sliders were. So I tested most of these 43 chips that I took out, and all the ones that I could test, tested okay. So while I didn't save myself any time uh, troubleshooting by uh, taking out all these IC chips, uh, by taking them out and putting in socketed uh, new, new chips as replacements, I'm going to be making the synthesizer a lot more reliable for the person who buys it. So after a lengthy bit of time desoldering and soldering, I've changed all the polarized capacitors and the IC chips on this board and the filter, and I put all the IC chips in the sockets. Um, pretty tall order, but it's done. Now it's time to turn my attention to the sliders. So like I mentioned, spraying contact cleaner into the sliders is not going to solve the problem. You can see all uh, dust and, and road case foam there. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be disassembling each of the sliders and giving them a proper cleaning. Inside the slider here actually isn't as bad. A lot of the stuff got caught up on the top, but we're going to clean the uh, we're going to clean this out, uh, remove the old grease uh, and dust that's in there, and we'll relubricate it. We're going to clean the wiper. We're going to clean the shaft off. We're going to clean the uh, conductive track here. See how it's not shiny and we're going to clean all the crud off the top here. And here's that same slider after the cleaning. So what I did is I uh, washed and degreased the shaft with the wiper and the uh, back of the slider where all the, the nasty uh, gummy grease was. And I cleaned this. Um, these, uh, um, compared to the other ARP sliders, you can't just pop out these uh, conductive and resistive elements because they're, they're kind of... Uh, connected here you'd have to unfold these tabs which would be a bit of a pain but this is pretty easy to clean out and then you can see now the conductive track is, is very shiny um, and clean uh, the wiper where it makes contact is shiny and clean everything is degreased so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some new fader grease in here and on the back of the shaft where it rubs and I'm going to put it back together and test it out I've seen some people um, that when they talk about lubricating the sliders, they just randomly spray lubricant in or apply lubricant to places. And like they think that like you want to apply lubricant in here 
and, and you don't. You want this to be free of, of lubricant or other chemicals because you need these two uh, metal pieces to make perfect contact. And if you gum this up with lubricant uh, or grease, uh, it's not going to make contact like it should. The lubricant goes on the non-conducting moving parts. So in this case, it would go on the back of the slider shaft, which rubs around in here, and possibly a little bit here on the top of the slider shaft where it, where it makes contact with this part of that half. And here's the completed slider, all nice and clean and smooth and tested. And uh, now there's just a lot more of them to do. So this is going to take a while, and I'll show you the board once I finish the rest of the sliders and put them back in place. And here's the completed polysynth board with the uh, socketed ICs, the new capacitors, the enhanced filter submodule, and then all the beautifully restored sliders that are nice and smooth now. So now we can move on to the next board. So as if that last board wasn't large enough, this board is even larger. So this is the uh, second of the large boards. This is the lead mix board. And it gets its name because it's the home of the lead mono synth as well as the mixer. So the lead synth has two VCOs and just like the base VCO we can spot them pretty easily thanks to the temperature compensating resistors. There's one here for each oscillator. Uh, there's also a thermally coupled pair of transistors and a silver mica capacitor. So that makes those uh, oscillators pretty pretty easy to spot. Uh, just like with the base VCO, the lead synth VCOs are made of discrete transistors and JFETs. Uh, the ICs that we see around there are just transistor arrays. We've got another 4075 filter submodule on here as the VCF for the lead synth. And we have a bunch of other stuff like the envelope generator, the LFO, a trill oscillator, and the VCA. So the mixer is also on this board, which buffers and mixes the outputs from all the sections into stereo and mono outputs. So we've got sliders here for bass, lead synth, polysynth strings, and actually the external input here is the fifth slider. And there's a master volume slider. And you can see that these sliders are different than these. These are the uh, same style of sliders that are in other older ARPs like the Odyssey and the Omni and the Pro Soloist. Whereas these are the kind that you are, are unique to the Quadra and they're also found in the ARP Solus. There's a bunch of transistor arrays and op amps in this area which, which handle the mixing and buffering. I should mention that there's no controls for the stereo panning of the individual sections. Strings always comes out the right output, polysynth always on the left, and everything else is always balanced evenly on both channels. So the controls that are here are solely for the volume. So we're going to go all out on this board as well we're, uh, and do the same kind of restoration we did on the previous board. We're going to remove all the sliders. We're going to remove the filter submodule. We're going to change all the polarized capacitors. So there's t electrolytic capacitors, tantalum capacitors. Uh, we're going to clean the switch. We're going to disassemble all the sliders that we remove and give them a proper restoration. There's actually a slider here with a broken shaft, so we're going to have to replace that shaft. And then we're also going to replace all the IC chips. There's one capacitor where the uh, leads poke out underneath this uh, right angle header, so I actually had to desolder the right angle header, and now I can get to that remaining pin of the capacitor to desolder it. You can see that the newer style of slider kind of held up a little better than uh, the older ones in terms of stuff getting inside. Uh, here, it's not too bad inside, but you see a lot of stuff on the shaft here. The older style, style slider, the road case foam entered and turned into this sticky bluish green gunk, which renders this slider pretty much unusable. So there would be no way to squirt some contact cleaner in and, and get this clean. You have to disassemble it. And here's what that same slider looks like cleaned out. And here's the lead mix board with all the new IC chips and capacitors in place, the filter module enhanced and recapped, as well as the refurbished sliders installed. And I replaced this broken shaft with a new old stock slider shaft that I'm fortunate to have a limited quantity of. And up here we have the pile of old ICs and capacitors I took out. Like with the last board, I tested the chips that I removed, and this time I found two op amps that had failed. Uh, this board actually uses five different types of op amps, so 301s, 
1458, 4558, TL081, and TL082. And the two that failed were both 4558s. And while I didn't keep it straight where I took the bad ones from, most of those are used in the mixer section. Uh, so it probably would have been really obvious that we had a failed op amp if we um, hadn't replaced the chips. Uh, I replaced all the op amps with the same uh, type as the original. And I should give you a heads up that I noticed that the through hole version of the LM301, which is used in all of these ARPs, has been discontinued. Uh, purists can still get them as surface mount and then solder them to a little adapter to make them fit as through hole. But when I run out, I might just start using a better op amp as a replacement. But I have a bunch, so it's going to be a while, and then we'll see. So it looks now like we've almost got this ARP Quadra gutted. Uh, one of the last boards we have here is the microcomputer board. And the membrane switches from the panel poke through some slats that are in the panel here and here. And they need to be disconnected very carefully to remove this board. Here's that microcomputer board out. And as you see, it comes out with the LED board. So we're going to remove some screws from the back of this and then pull this apart from the connector to just get the microcomputer board by itself. So now we've got the CPU board out and can have a closer look at it. It's based around this processor here, the Intel 8048, which is part of the Intel MCS48 processor family. And that, that processor family wasn't as widely used as other processors of the day, like the Z80, the 6502, the 6800, or even the Intel 8088. For reference, most other vintage synths of this era use the Zilog Z80 processor. So this 8048 chip has one kilobyte of ROM on board and uh, a whole 64 bytes of RAM on board. Uh, over here we have the battery backup memory, uh, which the CPU board uses for the first of its two main jobs, which is to store the presets. So basically the CPU scans the membrane panel switch matrix and feeds that down the line to the analog circuitry. So the synth knows what features to turn on and off and how to route the analog signals. You can also save the state of those switches into one of the 16 presets which is stored on this memory chip and preserved by three AA batteries uh, that, that get mounted onto the back. And uh, as I mentioned before, the presets are just the state of the membrane switches. The synth doesn't store the values of the sliders, like the Oberheims and the Profits 5 stores the value of its knobs. So in my opinion, the lack of this feature is a huge shortcoming of the Quadra. And while I would have liked to have been able to solve it with some kind of upgrade, it's just not possible since the sliders uh, aren't visible by the CPU or the DAC. Speaking about the DAC, uh, which stands for Digital to Analog Converter, the Quadra does have a DAC, which is located right here, uh, which it uses for the second of its two main jobs, to scan the key bed and provide control voltages based on the key you press uh, to the oscillators and the filters. So it's this 7523 chip, which is an 8-bit DAC, which is pretty weak. And even weaker, the Quadra only uses seven of those eight bits. So because of the low resolution of the DAC, it's going to introduce some error to the control voltages it spits out for each key. We can compensate for the error on the C keys through calibration, but all the keys in between are going to have a slight error, up to a few millivolts of control voltage. Probably not enough to notice it when you play, but enough for my inner engineer to cry at this design. So we're going to do the same thing to this board that we did to the last two. We're going to replace all the polarized capacitor and the TTL, CMOS, and op amp IC chips using my kits. And uh, so we have some tantalum capacitors here and here. And naturally all the chips that we're going to be replacing are the ones that are not in the sockets. This is CPU, port expanders, DAC, and uh, the memory chip. Uh, we're going to leave those alone unless we find a problem with them later. And here's the finished board. Uh, one thing I'm going to point out up front, since some viewers with sharp eyes are going to notice it and then call me out on it, is this capacitor right here. Well, I'll zoom in a little closer so you can see it. So I'm talking about this blue capacitor right here. So the original capacitor that was there was a tantalum capacitor, and you can a polarized capacitor. You can see the little plus marked on the board. And I've replaced it with a ceramic capacitor, which is non-polarized and can go in either way. Uh, in the past, there's been some discussion about me replacing tantalum capacitors with electrolytic capacitors. Uh, 
After the last video, there was some discussion about replacing axial capacitors with radial capacitors. So I figured this replacement is going to get some people even more bent out of shape. So let's talk about it. We know that capacitors have a capacitance, which we usually express in microfarads, and a voltage rating, which is the maximum voltage that a capacitor can withstand without breaking down. But there's a lot of other properties of capacitors that affect their performance, from the most basic properties like the physical size, cost, and tolerance, which is how much the actual capacitance can vary from what's marked on the part, to more advanced properties like leakage current, ripple current rating, ESR, which stands for Equivalent Series Resistance, ESL, which stands for Equivalent Series Inductance, Temperature Operating Range, and Temperature Coefficient, which says how much the actual capacitance will drift with the operating temperature. So what this all boils down to is that there's a lot of choices for capacitors, and there's the right time and place to use each type of capacitor. So when you select a capacitor, you need to look at the actual function of what that capacitor does in your circuit and select the capacitor that has the ideal properties for that specific job. So let's get back to this particular capacitor, uh, which I changed from a tantalum capacitor to an MLCC ceramic capacitor. So it's sitting right here next to the CPU chip, and ignore these two ceramic capacitors next to it. Those are uh, flanking the crystal for the clock, and they're not connected, um, they're not connected in, in relation to this capacitor that we're talking about. So it's sitting next to the CPU chip, and the positive side of the tantalum capacitor was connected to the 5-volt rail, and the negative side was connected to the ground. So you'll see capacitors used like that next to a lot of digital IC chips like CPUs, RAMs, ROMs, even regular TTL and CMOS chips. And when they're used that way, the capacitor is called a bypass capacitor. And its job is to provide a little reserve of juice so the chip always has a clean 5-volt supply or whatever supply it uses. Uh, because when the chip does its processing, its power consumption isn't constant. And as the transistors inside the chip switch on and off, the chip asynchronously draws more and less current, which can pull down the supply voltage at the VCC pin of the chip. So this little bypass capacitor needs to react at high frequencies, since the transistors inside the chips are working really fast. In fact, this CPU chip is clocked at 6 MHz. Tantalum and aluminum electrolytic capacitors pretty much have the highest ESR of all capacitors, and as such, they're more suitable for lower frequency applications. In fact, tantalum capacitors are almost never used as bypass capacitors. Instead, what's overwhelmingly used for bypass capacitors are ceramic capacitors, like these ceramic disc capacitors, and this MLCC, which I replaced the tantalum capacitor with. Uh, and the reason is because they have a much higher frequency response, and that's why I've replaced that tantalum capacitor with an MLCC. I'm not being lazy, I'm not being cheap, I'm not just grabbing whatever I have laying around on hand, and I'm never that way. I look at each capacitor, how each capacitor is used in the circuit, and make a thoughtful decision on what would be the best replacement. Anyway, getting back on track here, you can see that I've replaced all the old TTL, CMOS, and op-amp chips, basically all the chips that weren't originally in sockets, with new chips, and I put them in sockets. I replaced the tantalum capacitors with aluminum electrolytic, or MLCC, where appropriate. And uh, now we're ready to move on to the uh, remaining boards. So I've taken off the two remaining boards from the upper part of the case. They're just these two small boards that sit to the left and right of the key bed. And I'm going to clean the switches, and I'm going to desolder and disassemble and refurbish these sliders, since they're really stiff and sticky, like all the other sliders in the synthesizer were. And with that done, we've now finished our general work on the synthesizer of recapping and changing out the ICs on all the circuit boards. It probably looked a lot easier than it was since I didn't show the time-lapse video. I don't think the memory card in my camera would be big enough to hold all that. But I assure you it took a really, really long time to replace all those ICs and to disassemble and restore all the sliders. All in all, I wound up changing 108 ICs on these boards, changing 44 capacitors, and uh, removing, disassembling, and restoring 33 sliders. And while replacing all these IC chips took way longer than it would have uh, for me to troubleshoot and find the, the two that were actually bad, the synth is going to be way more reliable for its next owner because of it. And that's what makes it worth this huge investment in time. 
it would be really hard for me to justify charging a customer to do this as part of a repair job. But since this work is all on my own dime, I think it's worth it. So here's the big pile of parts that we changed out of the Quadra just in this video. So there's 108 IC chips. Most of them I was able to get out and test. Uh, a couple of them, uh, they, they got a little bent up when I took them out. And a couple of them tested bad. There's the uh, bad slider shaft. Uh, one of the 33 sliders had a broken shaft, so I changed that out. And then 44 capacitors and some additional resistors that we, we pulled out just in this video. So we'll add that to the pile from the last video, and, and that's a lot of parts. So pretty much now we have an empty shell left here. Um, we've just got the touch sensor and the key bed in the bottom. So I'm going to test the touch sensor, and I'm going to take the key bed out and refurbish it. I have other videos that show how you can restore these type of uh, Pratt Reed key beds that are found in most vintage synthesizers. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, show it again for the Quadra because it's, it's not really any different than the other ones I've already covered. Also the road case foam kind of stuck to some of the um, jacks in the back of the chassis, so the XLR jack and the IEC jack for the power, uh, the pins are, are kind of nasty, so I'm going to change out those uh, with a new XLR jack and a new IEC power jack. And then pretty much we'll be ready to put everything back together and test it out. So we'll be doing that in the next video. So please be sure to join me again soon. This has been Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.